great grandfather. Because <laughs> I look too young to be a grandfather, obviously. Um, <laughs> thank you for the, the laughter. Um, it's lovely to be with you, and uh, it's just been great to just spend a couple of days with you here in this fantastic city. Um, we ended, ended up ice skating on your canal last night. <laughs> Hey, well, well, I say ice skating, but what I was doing wasn't really ice skating. Um, <laughs> but my son was a lot better. Um, but it's just fantastic. And also just to hear the story of, uh, of Ottawa and what God's doing in this place and other cities um, around Canada. God bless you for all that you're doing. Um, I just want to come and say to you, and I think Mark will be saying as well, you're not on your own. Um, you are you are part of a bigger family, and uh, so we come from. Uh, I come from one side of the world, and Mark comes from another side of the world, uh, saying you're part of a bigger family, because God is doing something absolutely extraordinary around this world at the moment, and you're part of it. And we're all learning from each other. So uh, my job is just to hear all your stories and then take them other places. Um, to share them in other places. Have you heard what they're doing? Have you heard what that's what God is doing there and the, the subtlety of it and the, the particular strength that you bring? We take that story somewhere else. So I'm coming to tell you stories from other places. Is that okay? This is encouraging. I'll give you a whistle-stop tour around the world. It's a move of God's spirit, very much a move of God's spirit. It's all over the world. Uh, this is not due to one church, one city, or one guru. It's very interesting, that, isn't it? You know, we've had moves before, haven't we, of the Holy Spirit? And you usually say, well, it's that church, or it's that person, or it's that place. Now, you can't, you can't put this in any one place. It's happening all over the world. The expanse of it is mind-boggling, and I'll take you through that in a moment, and the speed is extraordinary. I've never seen something move so fast, so quickly like this. God is on the move, and he's speeding up. Um, and some of the older movements, certainly in our country, are kind of having to change a bit and think, oh my goodness, we thought we had this, uh, we thought we had this all worked out, and now suddenly there's a whole load of new movements who are well ahead of us. So there's kind of a bit of a healthy competition going on, which is good. Um, I could take you to York in uh, the northeast of our city, of our country, where they have been praying together at 7.30 on a Wednesday morning, 90% of the church leaders for 22 years for the revival of York. Praise God for them, yeah? This is an open-air baptism which was um, undertaken by the Archbishop of York and the Pentecostal pastor, Graham. <laughs> Took them two years to come up with the liturgy, but they did. <laughs> the Pentecostals nearly gave up, but uh, they didn't. Um, it made BBC television. Uh, fantastic stuff. 20 different charities formed from this movement. 20 different charities to serve the city. Stoke, which is in the sort of Midlands area of our country, was declared in 2000 the worst place to live in the country. Not a great accolade. They came together, the church leaders, there wasn't much unity, but they were so shocked that a guy, a friend of mine, brought them together and said, we need to pray. And they soon ended up repenting. And they ended up repenting because this is what they felt God say. On your watch, this happened. You're responsible for your city. You are the spiritual church of God in the city. And on your watch, this city was declared the worst place to live. So they didn't blame the government. They didn't blame the city council, and they could have done. They didn't. They said, God, forgive us, because we have this spiritual authority over this city. They came together, they prayed, they, they went to all the uh, leaders of the city and said, how can we pray for you? We don't know what to do. They said, we don't know what to do either. They said, well, can we pray for you? said, yeah, well, we'll take anything. We don't believe in it, but we'll take anything. <laughs> Number one prayer was that the soccer team, Stoke City, would make the premiership <laughs> because of the morale of the city, you see? It's linked, isn't it? Sport and morale, two years later, they made the premiership. It's the key to sporting success. <laughs> I could take you to Sunderland and uh, in the northeast of England, a very challenged town, one of our poorest towns, cities, and, uh, but there's a church there. I'm not quite sure what's going to happen with Brexit. Sorry, nobody is sure what's going to happen with Brexit. Sunderland particularly is anxious about it because a uh, Nissan car em um, employs 26,000 people across the city of 180,000. I mean, if they go, which they may well do, they're in trouble. But there's a church there and they've got a vision. In fact, they're going to have a meeting um, in a few months' time to decide a 15-year kingdom vision for the city. Isn't that good? That's a, that's a bit of taking responsibility, isn't it? Not waiting for Europe, not waiting for, for Westminster. They're going to take responsibility themselves. God, what's on your heart for this city? I could take you to Southampton. They went to their local authority and said, how can we serve you? 
didn't ask for money, didn't complain to them. The council was shocked. They never had voluntary groups come and say, how can we serve you? And they said, well, we need, uh, we need people for fostering and adoption. They've found 86 families. It has saved millions of pounds. Um, Bristol, they do a phenomenal work right across linking, particularly not just church leaders in unity, but business leaders in unity, arts leaders in unity, education and health. Phenomenal movement of God. I think that's a new development for many cities now. Teesside, where my son comes from, is uh, doing a fantastic job. The next movement day in our country, we had one about 18 months ago in London, which was a, a launch movement day, which brings together some of this city vision transformation stuff. They'll be having one. Uh, their last prayer meeting, they had 1,100 people at it. How many Christians in, in Teesside? About 6,000 6, Christians. 1,100 turn up to the prayer meeting. That's pretty good going, I think. God's on the move. I could take you to Newcastle, not in the UK, because it wouldn't look like this. This is in Australia. Um, they've been doing a city serve um, uh, with the Palau organization. Fantastic work there. Um, they served the city. They basically did loads of uh, painting and decorating and just went to the city government and said, can we serve you, can we serve you, can we serve you? They said, can we serve you because a paedophile ring was discovered based around the key Anglican church in the city and it placed the whole of the Christian community into disrepute. How do you respond when that happens? Well, you better go and serve, actually. You better go and love before you start speaking. You see, before you start preaching, you better go and serve and actually prove yourselves. Toowoomba, which is um, just outside Brisbane, they're doing a phenomenal stuff there. They've been working in unity like yourselves for many years. They've, just, they've decided they're going to set uh, Toowoomba free from pornography. Because there's a lady there who's, who's uh, made the significant link between uh, sexual and violent abuse against women and pornography. Um, most of these women that she'd been working with, the women in the sex trade in particular, most of it's linked to pornography. She's found, they, they'd led the leader of the brothel to the, to the Lord. She won't put pornography on the televisions in the brothel as you're waiting to see the women because it makes the men more violent. That's interesting, isn't it? Brothers and sisters, God's on the move in our cities at the moment. Yeah, they're going to set it free from porn. They, they, they've got the mayor involved and he said he's going to create a city free from porn. This guy has been, uh, the abuse this guy has had from around the world, the, the, the texts, the emails, the social media he gets. He doesn't care, he's 70 something. It's his last term in government. His ratings have gone through the roof ever since he did this. Because actually normal people don't like it either. Eh? They don't want violence towards women. It's, I could take you to Dallas where there's racial reconciliation happening now, phenomenal, very divided city. I could take you to Hong Kong, which uh, will be the gateway into China. Um, there's unity now developing, a movement day has been established there. Durban, um, where business people are coming together in South Africa, really beginning to ask questions about the future of this city and the abject poverty, particularly of the black and the Asian communities. Um, there are now movement days, which is part of the city transformation family in Dubai, in Jerusalem, in Charlotte, um, in Papua New Guinea. Transformation happening in the villages, and now it's going to happen in Port Moresby, which is the main city there. I could take you to Berlin, together for Berlin. What a wonderful group of humble people in probably the, you know, not a city blessed with bringing unity to the world in the 20th century. Um, uh, but there is a group of people in there, um, church leaders and Christians who are praying for Berlin, who are leading with humility and heart, doing a phenomenal job. The work they're doing among refugees um, in uh, Berlin and in other cities, in Frankfurt and Hamburg. God is on the move, just like he is here, back to Durban. Uh, he's always everywhere. It's happening. The building blocks, I think, are in place now. Four building blocks, prayer, undergirding everything. Without prayer, I know of no city where this is happening, where intercessory prayer has not been at the core of it. Often they're forgotten, by the way. We need to honor our intercessors, honor them, because they've done a phenomenal job. They brought it to the level to enable the unity to happen. Prayer is the key, and don't just leave it. You can't just outsource it, you know. You can't just delegate prayer. It's all of us together, isn't it? Um, Unity is the building block, of course. We're beginning to understand that we're not allowed to do this on our own. Well, we shouldn't do it on our own. We seem to be, kind of seem to happen as we do it on our own, but we were never meant to do it on our own. City, 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 town, place. That's crucial. 
We kind of got lost in the national thing sometimes. And, and, and in a way, you kind of, it, can be, it can be very theoretical. We're going to reach the nation. We're going to reach the nation. Well, how do you know whether you reach the nation? But you know whether your city's got better or not, don't you? You know whether your city's got better. What if you were to do it town by town and city by city? Then you'd reach a nation. That's how they extended the gospel in the New Testament, isn't it? City, unity, prayer, and kingdom. This is about kingdom. There is a new momentum arising. A new momentum. God is on the move. I think there is a frustration which is creating the momentum. I think people are incredibly fed up now with individualized model of church. I'm sorry, it's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. The Catholics are now leading us in evangelization. Amen? I don't know many Protestant churches talking about evangelization, do you? Sorry. Oh, we believe in it, but we're not really talking about it. The Catholics are now talking about it. Let's learn from our brothers and sisters in other places. We weren't meant to do this on our own. We weren't meant to do this on our own. You weren't meant to build an individualized church that didn't talk to anybody. Brothers and sisters, if my family didn't talk to each other, I would say that's dysfunctional. It's dysfunctional. They bring in the social services into those kind of families. <laughs> brothers and sisters, brothers and sisters, you are brothers and sisters with each other. Don't wait to heaven to get to know each other, okay? I think people are fed up with being chained to a pew, actually. Christians were not created to be fodder for the church. Amen? You were created to be a life changer. You were created to bring life. You were created to flourish. You were created to be the best nurse you could be and the best husband you can be and the best business person you can be and the best health worker. So when the, edu- when the, per- when the teacher comes into church, they're not just there for your Sunday school. Right. And the tech person comes into the church, they're not just there to press the button on PowerPoint. <laughs> Brothers and sisters, there's a bigger vision for them. I think people are fed up being chained to the pew and I think they're fed up with a limited gospel. We've somehow limited this gospel. Thank God for personal salvation. Thank God he found me at the age of 15. Praise God he did that. But he didn't find me to put me in a church to wait into heaven. He found me to be part of the answer to the world. A part of the picture. I think there's a growing frustration. <laughs> this should work actually, but they're, they're, anyway. Key, gri- key drivers cry for unity, frustration to release our people, our place and the big picture. So where are we all going with this? What's actually the end game? This is really important we ask this question, isn't it? What is the end game? Is it that we create the best church ever? I just don't think that, I don't think you can read that in scripture. For God so loved the church that he sent his only son? No, I don't think he did. I think he said, for God so loved the world that he sent his only son. And he uses the church to bring the mission of God, you see? Of course there is an incredible place for the church of God, but ultimately it's not about the church, it's about the glory of God. In all the earth, in all the earth, because Jesus is bringing all things to himself. Is that, the, is that the aim? What about Christendom? Is that the aim? So bring back a religious society. Who would love to live in a religious society? No, I'm not sure I'd like it. I don't know about you. Who's going to be in charge? Obviously the Baptists would take a precedent. <laughs> What if, we ran the poli- what if we ran the prisons? That'd be good, wouldn't it? We'd be forgiving everybody. <laughs> we need to ask hard questions. What's the end game? Because the end game in some societies has been make sure that the guy in charge, the king, is a Christian, then everything will be all right. Has that worked out well? Mm, not so good, is it, in some places? Um, is that the end game? I think this is the end game. God's kingdom vision for the city. He's coming to our cities. He's coming, I think, to create flourishing people. I have come that they may have life. Hallelujah. We live uh, on a social housing estate uh, next to a couple, sorry, a lady who has five children, um, three different men. Um, she's a gorgeous lady, actually. Uh, she loves her kids. Um, she lives in dysfunction. All around her, people are dysfunctional. I think Jesus has come to bring a flourishing into her, don't you? I think he loves her with a heart. I really do. We prayed that the people who, move in, who got moved into the house next to us would be people we could just share the faith with. Flourishing. I want to see a flourish. Amen? It's, it's that kind of thing, isn't it? People, people particularly who you wouldn't say, I'm, sure, I'm, not, I'm not sure they're really those kind of people. I, want to see, I don't want to see disabled people flourish. 
I want to see women flourish. I want to, I want to, see, I want to see people with, with real disabilities or mental illnesses flourish. And men, getting rid of depression, getting rid of mental illness. Please God, flourishing people. But not just individuals. We want them living in a strong community as well, don't we? Because that's what the biblical vision is. It's all about shalom, actually, I think. It's about shalom, God's wholeness and well-being coming to a place. And we know, of course, the best place and context to flourish is with Christ. Because then you get your sins dealt with and all the stuff and the healing comes. And, and of course, that's all part of it. But this is, I think, the vision. I think this is God's vision. And this is what we're giving ourselves to. How are we going to get there? Well, we put together a, a group of some of our city transformers across our country and theologians, and we began to ask this question. Well, if that's the core, then what are we actually aiming for? Well, in a way, I haven't got time to go through the whole slide, but, but in a way, what you're doing is, you know, we're, we're looking for a society over here where no one is held back or left behind from achieving their dreams and potential. That's a dream, isn't it? I don't want anyone left behind from that. I, th I think we need places that no who they are, where they come from, and where they're going. Some places get a, get a, some cities actually lose who they are. Sunderland, for instance, what I mentioned, produced 60% of the world's shipping at one time. And now you only produce a Nissan car, and you're not even sure whether you're gonna produce that. So you kind of know where you came from, but you don't know where you're going. It's really important a city knows where it's going. Um, we need creative and imaginative places. We need great education. We need effective technology, superb infrastructure, housing, health. We need great laws, don't we? We need great justice system. Amen? If you haven't got a justice system, how does your society work? It doesn't work because you can't trust anybody, can you? Um, we need businesses, but not just businesses that exist for themselves, but it's called inclusive growth, where the money actually comes back into the society. We need places where it's a great place to grow up in and a great place to grow old in. And we need safe, healthy, green spaces. This is kind of the vision, I think, to what we are called to bring about. Our Victorian forefathers in our country had a vision for this. In Birmingham, this is Birmingham in the 1800s when they put up the two up, twos downs um, to bring in the people off the farms to feed the industry. They forgot, however, to put in sanitation. Um, there was no gas, there was no heating, um, there were damp, squalid places, no education. Um, there were three guys, three Christian guys, two pastors and the mayor. And they decided this has got to end because we believe that a town should really flourish. It should be a solemn organism through which shall flow and in which shall be shaped all the highest, loftiest, truest ends of man's moral nature. They spoke like this in Victorian times. <laughs> So these three guys gave their ministries to this. Three guys. Three guys. This is what they achieved. By the end of their ministries, there was a higher ethical standard in civic life, extension of the vote, free school places, water and gas access, sewers were constructed, there was new housing, death rate was halved, high conversion rate and church growth. It is said of these three men, they left the city parked, paved, assized, marketed, gas, watered and improved. I think that's a pretty good thing to have on your tombstone. I could take you to Bradford in the 1950s, which was squalid conditions for the factory workers. This is Sir Titus Salt, the first hipster. Um, <laughs> he became mayor, a Christian man. And he, he became mayor, and, and for the first time, he began to understand the sheer poverty around him. So he went to all his industrial friends, and he said, guys, we've got to do something about this. We've got to do something about this. We've got to create better conditions. And to a person, they all um, disagreed. <laughs> and said, no, we prefer the money. So he decided, well, he moved out of Bradford just outside and set up his own incredible mill, which is at the time the, the world's first largest mill ever created. But he didn't just create the mill, he created the education and the church and the housing and the park because he wanted people to flourish and he wanted them to flourish in community. Hallelujah. Brothers and sisters, these, these, are guys, these are guys who did this. They led the way. Why can't this be done again? It would be done differently. I love the Kuiper, the Kuiper quote. There is not one square inch in the whole domain of human existence over which Christ, who is sovereign over all, does not cry mine. I will have it all, he says. I will have the education service. I will have the health service. I will have your businesses. I will have your roads. I will have your canal. I will have it all. Because he's bringing all things to himself, you see. Transformation. 
We're not just talking about something looking a little different. We're talking about a fundamental change, aren't we? This is the gospel. Spiritual transformation. Please, God. People come to faith. There's a transformation that happens in them. Please, God, the churches grow. Please, God, more churches are planted. But we're praying for more than this. We're praying for cultural transformation. We're praying for how a city thinks. Because how it thinks, therefore, it will do. We have to infect the culture with Christian values, you see. We're praying, of course, for social transformation. How are we going to get there? Big question. How do we get there? We think these are some of the key factors that uh, we're praying through ourselves and as we're talking about around the world. We think, firstly, we're going to have to grow the values. Very important that we're going to have to live the values and grow the values. Values that are, I think, at the heart of the unity movements actually will become at the heart of the cities because you're a city based on a hill within a city. The church is meant to live the values. So when the world says, how are we meant to live? Have a look at the city on the hill in the, in the city. Hope, humility, honor, diversity, love. Hallelujah. Diversity is key, by the way. Let the Catholics be Catholic, for goodness sake. Let the Baptists be Baptists and the Pentecostals be Pentecostal. Let the black Africans, for goodness sake, don't make them English. <laughs> Which is what the missionaries tried to do. So they brought in the organs. That's ridiculous. Why would you do that? to Africans and sit them down in pews. I'm sorry, I apologize. <laughs> Diversity. See, this is a new ecumenicalism. The old ecumenicalism was lowest common denominator. We don't upset anybody. This is a new kind of ecumenicalism. Upset everybody, okay? <laughs> no, when you go into a place, you don't say, what, what, what do I disagree with? You go into a place and say, what can I learn? I went to the Catholic Evangelization Conference. I was one of five ecumenical observers in, in Birmingham a year and a half ago. They had a worship band. I thought, whoa, that's very, didn't expect that. Kind of a gospel choir, ooh. Well, I didn't quite know, but because they were behind screens. They put them behind screens. So all you heard was the noise. And I, I said, well, why, why are they behind screens? And they go, well, we wouldn't want to detract from seeing Jesus, would we? I've got a feeling that would, would end Protestant, marketable worship, CDs, albums, bands, overnight. Amen? Join the worship team. <laughs> Brothers and sisters, let's go into places and say, where do I see Jesus here? Amen? Uh, what, this, uh, how we, what else are we going to do? We're going to... Um, we're going to have clear, monitorable vision. We think this is really clear. This is, sorry, this is very um, important. That, that as we go forward, we need to do a baseline. And a number of um, uh, cities around the world are doing things called movement days. And that's, that's really kind of taking things onto a new level. And it's asking the question, where is the city? What's the state of the church? And what's the state of the city? That's really important to ask. Because you need a baseline, don't you? If we're going to monitor any change here, how will we know it's changed? How will we know whether there are more churches planted or more people have come to faith? We've got to get a baseline. And then in three years, we can actually look at it again and say, has it changed? Have we managed to see some change here? That encourages us where we do, but it also stimulates us when, we're not, when it's not happening. So we re-look we, we re at it. Clear, monitorable vision, creating new ideas. Absolutely crucial. Another one here is, is around releasing our people to network. I've mentioned this before. We're about creating city transform transformers. That's what we're about to do. So please, God, you know that you get a vision. If, you're, you're, if you've got a normal job, okay? Um, please, God, you have a kingdom vision for what you do. And please, God, you're where you feel God has called you to be. Okay, if you're not, change job. It's really important. Your job is not just there. To feed your family, it is, thank God, but it's not just there to do that. Work is more important than that. There's a creational mandate on work. Work wasn't created after the fall. Sometimes it feels like that. We're created to be um, kingdom transformers, city transformers. So we validate, we empower individual Christians in that culture, in the cultural sphere. So wherever it happens. So let's get, let's get the business people together. Not just to be not just to be better business people, but actually empower them and validate them within Christian communities, forming their own unity movements within their own cultural sphere. You see, those, that, that guy in, in uh, Bradford, he was basically a Christian in business. He said, I'm going to do something about it. 
I'm going to do something about it. What if a group of 10 people in Ottawa, Christian business people, got together and say, we're going to do something about it? Lord, what do you want us to do? What, what could that do to Ottawa? It doesn't take a lot of people, by the way. It just took one guy in our country, William Wilberforce, to decide to end slavery across the world. He got together with a group of friends and they prayed for 40 years and worked hard. I think they would have given up as a, if there was social media in those days because the flack he got was horrendous. But he did it in the end. So we link them together. But we don't just link them together. We link everyone together. So if you have a media network that meets with a business network that overlaps with an arts network and a politics network and an education network and a social just ne justice network and all the other networks with the church leaders network, brothers and sisters, that's when you begin to get city change. Amen? My wife brings together the artists in our city. She put on a huge um, thing across the city uh, for the Lent a couple of years ago. She got onto our National Radio 4 four times. National Radio 4, okay? She never did a press release. How did that happen? Because somebody, the media is based in Salford, which is next door to Manchester, and there's a Christian community, and she knows one of them. And they went back and shared it with the producers of these programs who happened to be Christian, and suggested it to their key producers to say, could we highlight this? That's when you get synergy. You see, you don't do things on your own. You're beginning to connect things right across the whole city. This uh, bottom part here, which is uh, reimagine a new story of the city, this is very important because as this isn't just around strategy, isn't just around sociological change. This is around the word of God and hearing the word of God for your place. Hearing the word of God for your place. So we need to reimagine a new story for the city. A new story. Words get said over places, don't they? You, get, you can get very negative words said over places, can't you? Um, we need to speak what God's word is over a place. I finished with this story from Salford, um, which is uh, right next to part of, part of Greater Manchester. These are the docks in, um, in the sort of early 1920s, early 1930s. This was the heart of the Industrial Revolution. All the cotton came into these docks, went out to the mills, and then the textiles went around the world. This is the very center of the Industrial Revolution. By the 1980s, they're derelict. Derelict. The ships got so big they couldn't come down the canal, and the whole business moved somewhere else. And this is, of course, a picture not just of the docks, but of the whole city. Um, phenomenal dereliction. Unemployment was horrendous. Um, Education was appalling, one of the worst education systems, city systems in the country. Um, this is a new block of flats that went up five years uh, after these uh, pictures were taken. Um, dereliction. Uh, the whole city was run by five crime gangs. Five crime gangs ran the city, basically. You couldn't do anything. Every church just went or just got smaller and smaller. There's only one church of 100 people. This is a city, by the way, of 200,000 people, okay? One church of over 100 people. Every other church was 20 or 30 people. Nothing happened in this city. Nothing. Nothing. Except one man. He worked for the city mission. And he said, I'll stay. And he stayed. And he got abused. He got stoned. He got, literally got stoned. He had to have a metal front door because they used to keep knocking it in. The, the church had to have metal grids all around it. Um, he was known as Hero, actually, in the area because he, he stood up to the gangs. Um, he saw very little fruit in his ministry, but he had a son called David. And David went to Bible college and said to the Lord, I'll serve you anywhere in the world, except. <laughs> and you know the rest of that story, don't you? God gave him an angelic visitation because you need an angelic visitation to go back there. It's a long story. God told him to bring the pastors together, so he, he put on a lunch. It's the only way he could get them together. Um, did that for years, and he just prayed. He just walks the streets and prays and prays and prays. He knelt down by this place here, um, and he, God said, sorry, he said, God, I've got to have a word for this place. You've got to give me something to believe in. God said, one day, Salford will go to the world and the world will come to Salford. So he believed it. 
So he'd come to our ministers' meetings in Manchester and he'd talk about how good Salford was, how it was going to be great. It's really up and coming, he said. Everyone's looking at him thinking, you're mad. <laughs> you're utterly mad. Oh, it's wonderful. Ed, our education system, he says, is going to be one of the best in the country. No, it's not. <laughs> it's the... oh, I tell you, he said, buy a house in Salford. So we said to him, didn't you buy a house for £26,000 and then it went down to £2,000? He said, yes, he said, but we still got the house. Yeah. Great. So we prayed. And then God brought a Christian woman uh, from my previous church to run the police. And she decided to take on the crime families. First person who decided to give it a go. And then he sent a Christian lady to head up education. And she decided that Salford was going to be the, one of the best education centers in the country. And then God sent a Catholic businessman who saw a way to make money. So he bought the docks. He bought the docks. Nobody wanted the docks, so it was fairly cheap. <laughs> and then they found out the BBC were going to move. A third of the BBC were going to move from London. They needed to get out of London. And, uh, and they decided they would go to Bristol, they would go to Manchester, or they would go to Birmingham. But he went down and said, I'm going to give you a place and I'm going to build you a media city. This is the place. And that's the exact spot where Dave prayed. And on our television sets every morning, morning television comes from this place and goes out to the world. And the world comes to this place. 100 plus 30 media companies, the fourth media city in the world. This is Salford. Unemployment is down, education is up, crime is down, and morale is up. If you wanted to kill a church in Salford, praise God. Yeah. If you wanted to kill a church in Salford, that's what you had done before. Now they are tripping over each other to plant churches in Salford. If you want to make money in Salford, buy a house. Well, actually, you're, you're way down the list now. My mate Dave's looking really good at the moment. His house has gone through the roof. You see, it's more than that. Because the largest church outside London now, guess where it is? In Salford. 4,000 people. People are coming to faith. It's a popular place to plant churches. Several churches well into the hundreds. Brothers and sisters, this is the vision God gives. Can we reimagine a city? Can we reimagine our cities? This is a book which we've developed and I've edited from city stories around our country. Salford Story is in here. Um, it's available out the back. But can I just read to you a poem to finish with? Can we stand together? Is that possible? Montreal, Ottawa, Hamilton, Vancouver, Toronto, and others. I see a new city poured out from heaven, dressed for a party, blazed with beauty. Her rooftops are radiant, trees trembling with laughter, and joy like a jewel shines in her streets. From her walls and windows, no weeping is heard. Through her gateways and gutters, floods of tears do not flow. For in her homes and houses no pain dwells. Bricks once broken down in mourning rise again in song and celebration. Stones thrown down by enmity and envy dare to dance in swirling swathes of mercy. She sings, a million voices rising. The lost languages of human hope, the secret praise of human hearts released at last. Because her God is with her. Because his home is made within her walls. Because his voice is heard gentle like the rains of spring declaring new, new, new. This is the city I see. The future I belong to. This is the blueprint my heart holds on to. Even now in streets that sing another story. Even here beneath darker vision's shadow. This metropolis of mercy. Promising future realization. Active now in love's imagination. This is my dream. And though I wait. And though I long. And though the sacred city may seem slow. Still I will hope. 
still I will pray. Still I will today rise up and build. Amen. Amen.